be in Mark chapter 11 this evening. Very excited about this passage of scripture. And I pray that it will encourage your heart. I want to tell you I love you tonight. And I thank the Lord for you. I'm so glad each and every one of you are here. It's an honor to share the word of God with you. Again, in Mark chapter 11, and we'll begin reading in verse number 27. Mark 11 and verse 27. text we're looking at tonight is verse 27 down through verse 33. We'll try to read that entire portion together here in just a few moments, but just let me draw your attention to just verse 27 right now in that first line. It says, and they come again to Jerusalem. That's the Lord Jesus and his apostles, and you know this by now. We've been mentioning this for the last month. This is the last week of the Lord's life. And at night, the Lord and his apostles are staying in a village on the other side of Mount Olivet. Remember, what's the name of that village? Do you recall? Bethany. Bethany. Yes. I have a daughter named Bethany. That's where we got that name from. Other than the fact that she was also partially named after her grandmother, Betty Ann. <laughs> Betty Ann, Bethany kind of sounds together. So they would spend the nights in Bethany, and then in the morning, the Lord and his apostles would travel to Jerusalem. Do you remember about how far of a journey was that? Two miles, two miles one way, about a two-mile commute. They're very good, that's right. And it says there in verse 27, they, came, they come again to Jerusalem. Let's remember how different portions of the Bible describe the city of Jerusalem. In the Gospel of Matthew, that city is called the city of the great king. Yes. Also in Matthew's Gospel, that, that uh, city is referred to as the holy city. And Jerusalem, there's a very special holy site that exists there in the city of Jerusalem at this time in Mark chapter 11. What was that special building? What was that holy site? The temple, that's right, the temple of God. And during this particular week in which this event is taking place, the last week of the Lord's life before his crucifixion, the population of Jerusalem had exploded to about three times its size. And somebody tell us why. Why were there so many people coming into Jerusalem that week? Passover, Passover that's right. <clears throat> three times a year, <clears throat> excuse me, Jewish men, the men of Israel, were expected to come to the holy city, to the temple site, to observe Passover and two other festivals as well. And, and uh, some authors will say that they were at this time in Mark 11, that city that's normally running about 55,000 people. Some authors would say there's about 180,000, 200,000 people on site during this week. One well-known author by the name of Warren Wearsby his estimate is that there's over 2 million people in and around the city of Jerusalem at this time. So if you could just picture the scene here, lots of people in this very special holy week there in Jerusalem. It says they come again to Jerusalem and then the very next line of verse 27 says, and as he or Jesus was walking in the temple. So he not only went to the city of the great king, and by the way, as you study the scriptures, you learn that Jesus is that great king. Amen. And um, as he gets to Jerusalem, he goes into that holy site, the house of God. There's not another place like it on earth at that time. That temple no longer exists today. About 30 years after the event in Mark 11 took place, about 30 <coughs> years or so after that, the Roman armies came in and destroyed the temple. But there was no other place like that house of God anywhere on earth at that time. And Jesus was there. And you, you wouldn't expect that the Holy Son of God would be opposed and executed in the holy city. Right. The city of the great king. You just wouldn't expect that to happen, right? right. That's exactly what's going to happen within just a few more days. This is the third time, as we're reading here in tonight's text... This is the third time in this chapter that Jesus has entered the temple. 
Look there with me in chapter 11, verse 11, please. It says, And Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple. Then look at verse 15. It says, And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple. And now again in verse 27, And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple. He's, it, that only about 48 hours has passed or so, and he's already been in the temple three times. Hey, let's make a habit of going to the house of God, right? Amen. Uh, and when you study the Gospels, you learn that the Lord Jesus, he cleansed the temple, the house of God. He cleansed it here in verse 15 and 16. Remember, we looked at that. Um, uh, maybe it was earlier this month or at the end of January, how he cleansed the temple there in Jerusalem. And he had also cleansed that same sanctuary, that same campus, he had done the same thing. He had cleansed it about three years earlier. You read about that at the beginning of his ministry. Right after he had performed his first miracle of turning the water into wine, then uh, he was there in Jerusalem and he cleansed the temple of these merchant men and, and the animals they were trying to sell to the pilgrims coming in. And now here, three years later, in, God, in Mark's Gospel, in chapter 11, he's cleansing the temple again. Jesus got rid of stuff that didn't belong in the temple. Amen. Do you remember that point we shared before? Now, Christians, today, we don't go to the temple in Jerusalem to worship God. But there, are, there is still a temple. In fact, to be really specific about it, in God's eyes, now there are multiple temples. But it's not temples made of stone. There's the, according, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, the Holy Spirit of God tells us, He tells the church, He says, you are the temple of God. Amen. Right now, look, it, it, you may not recognize it, you may not understand it, you may not have even known it before, but if you're saved, if for the saints that sit here at Lulatin Baptist Church tonight and that, that uh, belong to this church family and we go about our days all throughout the week, God looks on us as one of his temples. And he is here. That's exciting. Amen. Yes. Um, it's a great honor. Amen. But then there is also another temple, isn't there? Not only is it the church as a whole is the temple of God, but there's also, what, what's the other temple, y'all? For those of us who are saved. What is it, Miss Lynn? Our bodies. Our bodies, right? In uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, we're drawing a blank on the verse. 1 Corinthians 6, I believe it's, I'm going to turn there, make sure. I think it's 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I'll just read it to you. Uh, oh, it's 1 Corinthians 6, 19. I'm sorry. What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Mm -hmm. See, God says if you're saved, whether you realize it before or not, your body belongs to him and he dwells inside this temple. Boy, what a great privilege. Amen? Amen. Now, we, here's what we, here's the point in saying all that. Here's the purpose for it. Just like Jesus went and cleansed the temple in Jerusalem and got things out of there that didn't belong, and he had to do it on multiple occasions, mm -hmm. we need to be willing to let the Lord do that in our temple as well. Amen. Amen. And I'm talking to us as a church. We need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit of God, to the Spirit of Christ, and say, Lord, is there anything in our church, so to speak, is there anything in your temple, this body of believers, that's not pleasing to you, that shouldn't be there, that doesn't belong? Lord, we want to invite you to cleanse it. That would be good for us as a church. You know, you, you, you might think, you know, we were talking about having a prayer meeting Sunday night, March the 5th. You know, what can we pray for? Well, we can come together as a church and say, Lord, please show us, is there anything in our church? And I'm not saying that there is, but we just need to be open to it because sometimes he might show us things that we're not even aware of. Lord, anything that displeases you, anything that's not right for this temple of God, would you get it out? He'll answer that prayer. But then also as individual believers, as individual temples, so to speak, It'd be good for us to go to the Lord and say, Lord, would you cleanse me? Search me, O God. Examine this temple. Is there any attitude, any behaviors 
any thoughts that are not pleasing to you. Lord, would you get it out of there? And he'll have to, as, as long as we walk on this earth, hey, uh, we as Christians, we, we battle with sin every day. I like what one old saying goes, it says, if you're, as a Christian, if you're breathing, you're battling. Mm -hmm. Battling what? Battling the flesh. Battling sin. And just like the Lord had to cleanse the temple on multiple occasions back in Jerusalem, there's multiple times he needs to cleanse Steve Beal. Because sometimes I let things into my life that shouldn't be there. Whether it be wrong thoughts, wrong attitudes, wrong behaviors, whatever it may be. Are you with me on that? Amen? Amen. Okay, so the location of this scene in our text, it's taking place at the city of Jerusalem in the temple. And again, you would think that everything would be going great at the house of God, but no. And then this passage also mentions some certain activity at the scene. We'll read about the activity in verse 27 and verse 28 where the Lord, he gets approached by the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. We'll talk about that more in just a moment. And there's a, a conflict. There's a confrontation that's happening in the house of God. Mm -hmm. But if you hold your place in Mark 11, just look at the very next book for a moment, if you would, please. And, and thank you for bringing your Bibles tonight, for being so respectful, and thank you for listening so well. Look at Luke chapter 20 for a moment. This is the parallel passage. It's the same scene, just recorded in a different gospel. Luke chapter 20, and verse 1 and 2. It says, and it came to pass, we'll just look at verse 1 right now. And it came to pass that on one of those days, one of those days in the last week of the Lord's life before his crucifixion, while he was there in Jerusalem, one of those days, as he taught the people, look what he was doing in the temple. As he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders. Okay, so Luke gives a little bit more indication as to what's going on. Uh, what kind of activity is taking place this particular day in Mark chapter 11. Jesus had been teaching the people and preaching the gospel. Well, we've been talking a lot about that word lately, haven't we? And uh, I wonder, this is just a little side thought, really has nothing to do with the rest of the sermon, but just want to throw this out, with, out to you. I don't want you to answer out loud, just want you to consider this for a moment. It says he was teaching the people and preaching the gospel. Have you ever wondered, what's the difference between teaching and preaching? There is a difference. By the way, there is a place for teaching and there's a place for preaching. If, you, if you're writing notes down, I hope you'll mark this in your Bible or in your notepad. Teaching, and now there are different explanations for this. I'm going to share with you one tonight. Teaching is meant to inform. Preaching is meant to transform. Isn't that exciting? Amen. He wanted to inform the people. Hey, Jesus wants to inform you tonight. He wants to bless you, but he also wants to transform you. Amen. Let him do that. Amen. Let him do it. So, there's, there's activity at this scene. Back now in Mark 11, we're going to see that Jesus is confronted by the re religious rulers of the temple, and they are challenging the Lord's authority. We haven't even read the whole text yet, but they basically come up to him while he's there in the temple and said, Who do you think you are? Why have you been teaching the people here? Why have you been preaching? We're the religious leaders here. You didn't talk to us about that. And yesterday, by the way, Jesus of Nazareth, yesterday you came in here and chased off all the money changers and the animals and all, and all the merchants. Who gives you this authority to come in here and to do all this? See, that's, that's the situation. That's the activity taking place here. And he's being confronted by these religious rulers. 
the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now, I promise we'll get to the whole text in a moment, but please notice this. The true intentions of this group have already been identified. We know what they're after, don't we? Yeah. And we've already looked at what, what, what are their true intentions, y'all? Yeah, they want to get rid of it. Yeah, just, just for a, a quick review, look at Mark 8, 13 for a moment. Okay, Mark eleven twenty seven says, The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders come and confront Jesus there in the temple. Chief priests, scribes, and elders. Those are code words for the religious rulers of Israel. And look at Mark 8, 31. Mark 8, 31. Who would like to read that verse out loud for us? Brave on zero. Wallace, I saw your hand first, man. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and re be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed at, after three days rise again. All right, so thank you, Wallace. It's a great job. So here we see, back in Mark 8, the Lord's already telling his followers in advance, look, the religious leaders are going to reject me. And they're going to see to it that I get killed. And again, there, verse 31 of Mark 8, he mentions the elders, chief priests, and scribes. Well, you can see that whole bunch repeated in Mark 11, 27 in our text tonight. Look at, um, who would like to read chapter 10, verse 33? Miss Lana, please. Chapter 10, verse 33. saying, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be delivered unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles. All right, thank you. So again, the Lord's, he already knows in advance what's going to happen. How does he know that's going to happen in advance? Because that's the power of God. Amen. That's the omniscient, all-knowing God. He knows what's going to happen in the future. Man, I don't know what's going to happen in the next three seconds. But the Lord says, I, I'm, I'm going to Jerusalem. He's telling his followers. He said, I'll tell you where it's going to happen. It's going to happen in Jerusalem. And I'll tell you who's going to do it to me. It's going to be the religious leaders. And I'm going to tell you what they're going to do. They're going to condemn me, and they're going to turn me over to the Gentiles. That word means to the Romans. Okay? And then one more example. Who'd like to read back in Mark 11, verse 18? Mark 11, verse 8. Uh, did I get that right? Let me make sure. Um, not verse 18. Let me see here which verse it is. Uh, sure, it looks like it. Yes, yes, verse 18. I'm sorry. All right, who'd like to read that verse for us, please? All right, Miss Melanie, please. And the scribes and chief priests heard it and saw how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. Okay. So, I, I, we reviewed all that, just so you know, when we look at verse 27 again here in a moment, and the chief priests and the scribes and the elders come to confront Jesus, and they're asking him, who do you think you are? What right do you have teaching the people in the temple and preaching to them and chasing out all the stuff in here that doesn't belong? Who do you think you are? We already know what they're thinking deep inside. They don't like him. They want to get rid of him. And they're intimidated by him. Because the people are... Hey, it, don't, get, don't get the idea that all the Jewish people wanted to get rid of Jesus, but the leaders did. Yeah. I mean, the people just sitting there in the pew, so to speak, they're like, man, he speaks with power. He speaks the truth. I think he really cares about us. Um, at this point, we see the ongoing battle between Jesus and these Jewish leaders continuing to intensify. I mean, can you see now by here in our text tonight, Mark eleven twenty seven, they're not just kind of staying off in the distance. Really, I guess when you might see for the first time, they've come up and confronted him. I mean, it's gone to another level now. They weren't just thinking about hurting him. Now they've confronted him. Look what happens, by the way, in chapter 12 and verse 12. It says they, it's still, who is they referring to? The chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. It says, and they sought to lay hold on him, but they feared the people. When it says they wanted to lay hold of him, they wanted him arrested. Mm. <coughs> okay? Hey, you don't have to raise hands. But if you've ever been arrested, the Lord knows how that feels. Mm. Okay? 
And uh, so that's the background for the scene that we're about to read here now. And if you're willing and if you're able, if you'll stand with me, please, out of respect for God's word. And uh, let's see what happens. Starting here in verse 27, it says, And they come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, there come to him the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, and say unto him, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority to do these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask of you one question, and answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Jesus said, if you'll answer my question, I'll answer your question. Here's his question. Verse 30, the baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And they reasoned within themselves, saying, hmm, now that's a challenging question. If we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people. For all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. Verse 33. I'm going to try to explain to you all what all that means in just a moment, okay? Verse 33. And they answered, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, they answered and said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. Well, we're not going to give you an answer to that question you have for us. Jesus answering said unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. I want to share a message with you here entitled, In the Temple. All this is taking place inside, y'all, inside the house of God. Mm -hmm. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, it's, it's just a privilege to share the word of God to the people of God here in this house of God tonight. Mm -hmm. And Lord, we thank you that God is here. Amen. Lord, would you teach us? Lord, you want, us, you want to inform us tonight. And we believe your spirit wants to preach to us. You want to transform us tonight. Lord, may we go out of these doors tonight different than when we came in. Amen. And please show us what we should glean from this message. Lord, speak to us. Help us, we pray. In Christ's name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. Hey, it's often true that those who talk the most about God know the least about him. Here's a, a truth, I believe, little flock, that the Holy Spirit wants you to hear tonight. I understand for some of you sitting here tonight, I'm not being unkind, but I, I love you, but, but it's going to be true for some of you here tonight. It's going to be true for those watching online that you, you're going to hear this in just a moment, and it's just, it's just going to go right past it. But I want the people of God to hear this. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to say this to you tonight. Religious leaders resisted the Lord Jesus. Religious leaders will resist you. Um, notice some, some points tonight about this passage here that we just read. First of all, notice a question about John the Baptist. Again in verse 30, by this time the, the religious leader said, Jesus, who do you think you are? What right do you have coming in the temple and doing all these things? Teaching and preaching and casting stuff out. Verse 30, Jesus said, the baptism, I've got a question for you. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. You think, where did that come from? I mean, you know, they're having this conversation, who do you think you are, Jesus? And then Jesus brings up the baptism of of John. And uh, well, let's use the Bible to answer that question. All right, you, get, you ready to have a brief Bible study with me? Amen? Amen. All right, hold your place. Maybe put the ribbon of your Bible there in Mark 11. And let's go back to the first chapter of Mark. We're going to see in the very first chapter, in the very first few verses of the Gospel of Mark, the mention of a man by the name of John. There are several different Johns in the New Testament. This particular one is John the Baptist we're talking about. Jesus was referring to John the Baptist there in Mark eleven thirty, 30, and Mark 1 here is mentioning John the Baptist. By the way, John the Baptist and the Lord Jesus, how were they related? Somebody, here's a good Bible trick. Well, they were cousins, yes. All right. All right, look at verse 4 of Mark 1. The Word of God says, John, that's John the Baptist, John did baptize in the wilderness. Okay, baptize, hmm. The first time John is mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, John the Baptist, he's baptizing. Now remember, you don't have to turn back there, but remember Jesus said in our text, 
I want you to tell me the baptism of John, was it a baptism from heaven or a baptism of men? Okay, so back here in chapter 1, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and day of, what's that next word, y'all? Jerusalem. So people were coming from all over. Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him, John the Baptist, in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Um, and John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of, of a skin about his loins. And did he, he did eat locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, there comes one, somebody's coming. Somebody's coming mightier than me. Somebody's coming after me who is mightier than me. The latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. You, you know, what, okay, what in the world does that mean? Back in the ancient culture, that was the, if you had a servant in your house, that was the job of your slave, yeah. of your servant. When you got in the house, your slave was supposed to take your shoes off for you. And John is saying, hey, I'm, I'm you know, baptizing uh, preaching the repentance. God sent me to do this, but I want you to know somebody else is coming who's mighty to me. I want you to expect it. Somebody's coming. Amen. Okay? And he says, by the way, I'm not, this, this person is so wonderful and so powerful and so superior. I'm not even, you, you think the God is on me and God is, but I am not even worthy to be the servant of this person who's coming. That's pretty impressive. Are, are you with me? Some of you, some of you look like you're about to pass out of them. All right. All right. Uh, look at verse eight. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he, this person that's coming, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's pretty cool. Yeah. You know what John is saying there? I love this. If you want to write down next to verse seven, if you want to write this down, John is saying, expect him. Mm -hmm. Expect him. And then in verse 8, if you want to write down the next to verse 8, expect great things from him. John said, I'm just the messenger. I, I'm not the mighty one. Someone mightier is coming. I want you to expect him. He's coming. And when he comes, expect great things from him. Man, I'm baptizing you in the Jordan, this old dirty Jordan River. But when he comes, he's going to baptize you woo, with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Wow. That's pretty powerful. Uh, and, okay, look, look a little bit more about what the Bible says about John the Baptist. <coughs> Turn with me, please, in John chapter 1. We'll work our way back to Mark 11 here in just a few moments. But look at John chapter 1, please. We'll be done with our little Bible study here momentarily. But when you look at the Gospel of John, you know, this fourth Gospel is named after St. John. That's a different John. Mm -hmm. This is, the, this is one of the Lord's apostles. Okay? So there's a difference between the John who wrote the Gospel of John, who also happens to be one of the Lord's twelve apostles, and the other man named John the Baptist. Okay? But look what the Apostle John writes about John the Baptist in this first chapter. Look at verse 6, please. The Word of God says, There was a man sent from whom, y'all? God. That's a powerful statement. Amen. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. That's the same John Jesus is talking about in our text tonight. Amen. The same one who was baptizing people. And people from Jerusalem were coming and hearing him preach and getting baptized. Look at verse 7. John 1, 7. The same, this same man, John the Baptist, came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. Jesus is the light of the world, right? Mm -hmm. John was sent to say the light is coming. Mm -hmm. Verse 9, that was the true light which lights every man that comes into the world. Jump with me quickly, please, over to verse 28. John 1, verse 28. These things were done in Beth Arbor, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. All right? And remember in our text tonight, Jesus asks his religious leaders, he says, is the baptism of John, is it from heaven or is it from men? Okay? 
here in John 1, 28, it says John was baptizing. Verse 29, this is great. The next day, John sees somebody coming. Who does he see coming? Jesus. Jesus. He sees Jesus coming unto him. And John said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Amen. Wow, that's our Savior. Amen. That's him. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is before, preferred before me, for he was before me. Do you remember? John had said, there's somebody coming after me who's mightier than I am. I'm not even worthy to be a slave. And then John sees Jesus walk up and said, that's him. That's the one I was talking about. He's here. All right, uh, look at verse 30. This is he of whom I said, uh, verse 31. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record saying, I saw the spirit from heaven like a dove. And it abode upon him. I saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and it came on Jesus Christ. Keep reading. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Boy, John the Baptist is preaching there. Amen. Woo! He's saying, that's the guy I'm telling you about. He has come. That's him. I saw the Spirit of God descend on. He's the one who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And he is the Son of God. Amen. Yes. Look at verse 35. Again, the next day after John stood and two of his disciples. I love this. John the Baptist preached the same sermon two days in a row. Mm -hmm. Verse 36, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. I like to see in your Bible the exclamation point there. And he's getting excited. Mm -hmm. That's him. He's the one that's been promised. I love verse 37. And the two disciples heard John speak and they followed Jesus. By the way, future preachers, future missionaries, future Sunday school teachers, what you want to do is you want to say, God, bring you to a point where I can point people to Jesus to the point that when they see him, they'll leave me and follow him. Amen. That's what you want. That's what you want in your church. That's what you want in your Sunday school class. That's what you want from your children. Lord, I want to point my children towards Jesus. So they say, wow, mom makes much of him. God's working in my heart about that man that mama's talking about. I'm going to follow him like mama said I should do. Amen. Right? That's what we want. And that was the ministry of John. Now turn back one last time, please, to Mark 11, 32. Mark eleven thirty two, 32. That's back in our text. Now you know what Jesus is talking about when he says, let me ask you religious rule or something. John's baptism. Did he get that idea from some man or did he get that idea from God? God. Okay. okay. Look at verse 32. And now here's the rulers talking among themselves. They say, well, if we answer... If we say that John's baptism was of men, uh, what are the people going to think? For all the people, or all the men, counted John that he was a prophet indeed. You know what these religious rulers are saying? Well, if we say that John the Baptist, if his baptism was just something some guy made up, then the people are going to get upset with us. Because they know that's a prophet. You know what a prophet is? A prophet is God's representative to man. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, the only prophets, listen, y'all, the only prophets I trust today are the ones in the Bible. That's right. Amen. That we don't need prophets today because God has given us the completed Bible. Amen. But back in John the Baptist day, they didn't have the complete Bible. So God would use these prophets, a, few, a select few, to give a message to the people since they, he knew they didn't have the complete book. Yeah. But they knew this man, John, he was, no, he was no hypocrite. He wasn't a fake. They knew he was God's representative. Amen. And the religious leaders knew the people felt that way. But back in our text, look at verse 31. And they reasoned with themselves saying, if we say... Well, John the Baptist, his, his baptism, his ministry comes from heaven. God gave him this ministry. Then Jesus will say, why didn't you believe him? You see the quandary the Lord's getting these religious leaders in? Um, you know, uh, 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 but verse 31 tells us right there, 
that the religious, of all people, the religious leaders did not believe the teaching and preaching of John. Mm. You know what's really amazing? They, these religious leaders did not like it that the public considered John the Baptist a prophet, but the public did not consider them a prophet. Mm. They had the title priest or scribe, but nobody was calling them prophet. No, you're not God's representative. Wow. Hey, there can be lots of jealousy in the ministry. You remember that. When I, I had one of our ladies mention to me this past Sunday, I won't call her name out right now, but she said, Pastor, I think God's dealing with me about being a Sunday school teacher one day. Wonderful. Wonderful. Time will tell if that's true you get into a ministry, there's going to be jealousy in the ministry. Mm -hmm. These religious leaders were jealous of John the Baptist. They <laughs> resented the fact that he had success. They didn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just keeping in mind now this thought about these religious leaders, a man won't receive new truth if he has rejected past truth. Mm -hmm. They, in the past, they rejected John the Baptist's ministry. Mm -hmm. They didn't believe him. So now, here's this new truth. What's the new truth? Here's Jesus, the mighty one, the son of God. But because, the, watch it, you reject past truth, you won't receive new truth. It's a dangerous thing to hear God's truth and say, no, I don't want that. That's right. No, I'm not ready. Mm. I don't believe it. Okay, uh, some comments about the house of worship, then we'll be done, okay? Mm. The, the scene here in Mark 11, 27 through 33, it's taking place in the temple, the house of worship there in Jerusalem. Sometimes, you're, just ask Jesus about this, sometimes your greatest enemies will be found in a house of worship. Mm. I... I I'm ashamed to say it, but it's true. You need to be aware of it. Sometimes the leaders in a house, sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes the leaders in a house of worship who should be guiding you in your ministry and your mission will be the ones resisting you. Mm. You need to be aware of that. It happened to Jesus. It's going to happen to you, right, Mama? Hey, y'all, there's an old saying, where there's light, there's bugs. Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. Probably when we get to our house tonight, we get, you know, we got the light right over our, our, our door that we enter in the house. There's going to be little bugs flying around, and there's going to be uh, frogs. frogs jumping after them, which drives my wife crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, when, uh, when, man, you think God's dealing with me about in the ministry, man, I, I want to serve the Lord. I want to, I want to be, I want to have a ministry in the house of God. Good, you do that. That's what God wants you to do. But when you do that, there's going to come bugs. Mm -hmm. Can you understand why we want to be so careful about putting folks in positions of leadership in your church? Amen. Can you understand that? Amen. Okay. Hey, let's thank God for the good leaders the Lord has given us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray that God will give us more good leaders. When I say good leaders, I'm talking about leaders who are saved. They are led by the Spirit. They are humble. They are teachable. They're flexible. Okay? Um, let's, and by the way, let's seek to be a leader who helps and not hinders. One day, God may put you in positions of leadership here. I hope He does. Amen. I'm praying. I've been asking the Lord. <laughs> I'm still going to keep doing it. I'm praying that the Lord will... Fill our church with spiritual leaders and with prayer warriors. Amen. And you might just be one of those spiritual leaders. A spiritual leader is not going to come in here and hinder the work of God. It's going to help. Amen. Okay? If this is the case, if you're going to run into opposition and there's going to be bugs when you get around the light, I mean, why even bother with getting involved in the house of worship? Why even do that? You have to face opposition. Well, just remember the story. If, you go, if you're to go walking in that temple... In Mark 11, 27 and 28, yes, there's these wicked religious leaders. There's also Jesus. Amen. That's why. Yes. And there's also a crowd in there who wants to hear him teach, hear Amen. him preach. Amen. 
Yes, we want to minister to the teachable. We want to preach to those who are willing to be transformed. And what do we do when the opposition shows up? And it's going to come from people you least expect. Mm. I mean, you understand, this is the chief priest, the scribes, the elders. You wouldn't expect them to be opposing the Lord. <coughs> you hear me out. <coughs> How do we handle that? Lord, you dealt with this before. Show me how to deal with it now. All right? Hey, you can find Jesus in the house of worship. Not every person in the position of leadership in a church is on the Lord's side. They might have a good title. They might have good talk, but they'll have an evil heart. Remember this. Jealousy is a real issue among many ministry leaders today. That's sad, but it's true. You know what that's all part of? That's all where we need the Lord to kind of come in and get rid of things in the temple that don't belong. Amen. Including jealousy and resentment and unbelief and resistance. In the temple, I'll share this with you, I'm done. In the temple there in Jerusalem, there was unbelief, there was resistance, there was jealousy, there was even murder in their hearts. Amen. Right? I mean, they were already setting the Lord up. They were trying to figure Amen. out how we're going to get rid of him. <clears throat> Now, I'll tell you this and we're done. That's at that physical structure in Jerusalem that, by the way, doesn't even exist anymore. But let's remember this, that there's another temple today. It's us. And you know what? That Even though we're saved, and I'm talking to the saints here, even though we're saved, there's still that spirit of resistance. We're not careful. That spirit of jealousy. That spirit that will even want to lash out and hurt somebody. I want to invite you, Christian. For those of you here tonight, those of you watching online, as the Lord's looking inside this temple, what does he see? If you'll bow your heads with me, please. Thank you for listening so well. If you're here tonight, you would say, Pastor, I know I'm not perfect. God's still working on me. But I do know that I'm saved. <coughs> and my sins have been forgiven. It's not because of what I've done. It's because of what I believe Jesus did for me. And I've been reminded tonight that because I'm saved, my body is his temple. Pastor, that's me tonight. Would you raise your hand? No one else looking around? Just raise your hand. I know I'm saved. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you for your hand. I'd like to invite you Christians. I want to invite you to go to the Lord and say, Lord, <coughs> search my heart. In the story in Mark 11, there was just some junk in the temple. There were some bad attitudes. There was some resistance. There was just sin being represented by those religious leaders. Lord, you... That tends to be in me too, Lord. <coughs> Clean me up. You had to cleanse the temple multiple times in Jerusalem. Lord, I'm asking you to clean me again. Amen, church? Amen. Let him know that. You invite him to do that. He deserves a clean, holy, pure temple. Yes. Now, before we close... Some of you didn't raise your hand the first time. I'm not going to point you out. But if you'd say, Pastor, would you pray for me tonight? I'm not saved yet. If I were to die, I'm not ready to meet the Lord. I don't think it would be a good thing. I haven't been transformed yet. But I'm willing. And I want to be saved. I won't call your name. I won't ask you to stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. The camera's not facing you. You know that. I want to remind you, friend, the Bible says Christ Jesus, this same Jesus, died on the cross for your sin. He was buried. He rose again the third day so you could be saved, justified, forgiven, transformed. Pastor, would you pray for me tonight? That's what I need. I won't call your name, but I do want to pray for you. Anyone raise your hand? Pastor, pray for me. I'm ready. Ready to be saved. 
Lord, thank you for this time. And uh, we'll be closing up here in just a minute. Lord, preach still a little bit over tonight, but the folks are very patient, very attentive. Lord, um, there's future leaders here. Those watching online. It's amazing that when, we, when you put us out on the ministry field, there will be opposition. Sometimes it'll be from lost people. Sometimes it's going to be from church people. Lord, when opposition comes from places we least expect it, help us to remember you know how to handle it. Amen. And you know how to kind of put the ball back in their court, so to speak. And those religious hypocrites were put in their place that day in Mark 11. And they, they didn't want to give an answer because you, you put them in their place. Lord, help us to remember when opposition comes. Help us not to quit, to get angry, just to turn it over to you. Then I pray for the lost here tonight. Lord, those that couldn't raise their hand because they're not sure. May they know tonight that they're loved. They're loved by the church family. Most of all, they're loved by God. Amen. May they be saved tonight. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, if y'all would, beloved, if you'll help me out.